Welcome to Relish Books. Today I'm talking about The Rosemary Tree by Elizabeth Googe. This is the only other title that the library had other than The City of Bells that I reviewed recently. And I enjoyed that one and I enjoyed the style and feel of the writing enough to where I checked out this one and I wish that the library had more but they have been kind of deficient in what I've been looking for lately. I feel like um, in our modern day and age, um, so much has shifted to digital. I look up a book in the catalog and it's like, oh yeah, we have this available. Five availabilities on digital only, no physical copies at the library. And I don't like that. Like they don't even have physical copies of Shakespeare. But anyway, that's beside the point. They did have this. I read it. I enjoyed it. I'm going to give try to give my thoughts again. A lot of the same things that I ran into with this one that I did with the City of Bells. Kind of Elizabeth Gouge's little gimmicks. I will say this one, I think that one was published in like 1936 or something like that. This one was published in 1954, I think. Or maybe that was 1934, this is 1956, somewhere around there. But I think there's a good few years of difference between them. This one is definitely more developed. In City of Bells, it felt like she had this problem where she introduced a, a fairly large cast of characters, at least to be main characters. They all feel like they're supposed to be main characters. You get chapters from their perspectives without a lot of individual development. This one had a bit of the same problem, but she did a better job with actually bringing them together. I think that is still an issue where she will introduce a character, particularly like, seems like it's setting up for a plot line with the character, and then not really follow through on it. The kind of villain in this story is Mrs. Belling, the headmistress of the school where three the three daughters of probably the most main characters you could say, this couple, John and Daphne, their three daughters go to the school. The headmistress is an evil woman in like a very peculiar type of evil, I feel like, for a novel. Um, the evil just of complete and utter selfishness and laziness. She doesn't actively do any bad things. She's just not a good person only likes herself, doesn't love anybody type thing. But it sets this up as like this great, dark, looming evil that is going to be a struggle throughout the book. And that struggle really very quickly goes away. There's a few encounters with her and then that's, that part of the story is just kind of over. It was really set up to be a big thing and then it's not. Which, yeah, it just felt kind of strange. Like that fell a little bit flat. And at first I really thought a lot of the plot lines were going to do that. One of the school teachers, actually both of the school teachers, Mary O'Hara and Miss Giles, um, at the beginning I felt like they were going to do that because they had a couple like brief perspective accounts where you get things from their point of view and then it kind of leaves them alone for a long time and I was like, oh, they're just going to, that's just going to fizzle out the way the other one did. They did get plenty of expansion, plenty of time in the book to feel like they worked as characters. And I do think the book works, like I said, a lot better than The City of Bells for how large the main cast of characters is. There isn't really a main character. There's a lot of people who are kind of at the center of the book and take turns in the narrative. And she does pretty good at weaving them all together. I do think if she had had a little less focus on so many and more perspectives from couple of the main people, it would have worked a little better. Ultimately, it's a story of this interconnected web of people who all experience a large shift, a large change in their perspectives, and kind of this spiritual awakening and release for all of them. Like all of Elizabeth Gouge's work, it's a very um, religious novel. Um, which a correction from my last video, I had said that I thought that Elizabeth Gouge was Catholic. She's actually, was actually Anglican or Church of England, which is very similar. A lot of similar beliefs, but there are a few differences. So clarification on that. Um, it can be misleading because she talks about saints 
a lot, saints and Virgin Mary, the stuff that sounds Catholic, but there are a couple differences in the religion. I understand. So anyway, it's very religious, a lot of religious themes. So the opening of the book uh, is like this change in the weather, which symbolizes the change that's coming to everybody, kind of a Mary Poppins thing. There's a change in the weather, a change is coming, and everyone is going to be affected by it. Everybody in this connected kind of circle. And so the book just kind of goes through and shows the great shift that kind of happens in everybody's hearts. It's um, ultimately, of course, a change for the better. It's really a book about discovering faith or refinding your faith or I should say and and forgiveness um there's a character that comes back from the past who's done a lot of wrong to another character and they work through that um self-forgiveness you know he's having to face the things that he's done there are there's always a lot of relationship themes in her books as well I really like her portrayal of marriages. So many authors do not know how to do a marriage. They try to do like a happy marriage and it just feels false and fake and kind of uncomfortable. There are authors who can write happy marriages very well. She is particularly good at writing these very real feeling relationships. I have complaints about her writing and I'll get to those in a minute, but the marriage I wish she'd actually dwelt on it more because you don't see it a whole lot. But the marriage between John and Daphne, who are so different. Their personalities are just naturally in conflict because they're very different people. And the circumstances of their marriage were not to set them up for success. She married him basically just to give herself a place to go after she had been dumped by her former lover. And... He is a man who is very, very scatterbrained. You know, he's a preacher. I don't remember the exact word that they use for him. Parson, maybe, would be the title that he has. Um, He is a passionate lover of people's souls, but he's very absent-minded. He forgets everything, and Daphne is a very efficient, controlled type person, um, but who really wants to be loved passionately, which is something that John doesn't really give her. He loves her um, gently and respectfully the way that he kind of approaches everything. So anyway, there's just this discontent, and you really, even in the brief um, passages that describe their relationship, you really feel it. You can feel that frustration that there would be um, him always forgetting what she asks him to do or, um, you know, if she tells him she's making something special for dinner and be home by a certain time, of course he always forgets if she asks him to do a little job for her or whatever, he forgets. Um, he's just an exasperating person to live with. And while she is very prideful and sharp and, all that. So you just really feel this tension. And at the same time, the way that their differences are overcome, the way that they um, do have grace for each other, the way that there's a tension and the way it gets eased just felt so real. And I think that that's rare to have somebody who writes realistically of a difficult, but not necessarily a bad marriage. Um, She writes about this very well in a lot of her other books, this idea of even if you're not with a person who suits you or who compliments you, you can still make a good, even a great marriage out of it. And I really appreciate because that's a very rare, a very rare approach. And throughout the book, they come to realize, you know, they think they have this unhappy marriage that they're just making it work. And then through better understanding, you know, one of the conflicts that kind of gets resolved, they realize they really are well suited to each other and can be happy together. So that's something that I really like about the book. Um, And a lot of the, yeah, just the ideas are really great. I like the way the characters were woven together. Um, 
Although I do think she, I do think she spread herself a little too thin with all the different stories she's trying to tell. But John and Daphne's characters, I did really like. Um, some of the characters I didn't care for. Mary O'Hara was very similar to the heroine in City of Bells, which I talked about why I didn't like her. She's too... Mary I liked a little better. I felt like she was more... She felt more real, more actually flawed, instead of just trying to be that kind of like, oh, she's so perfect, even her flaws are charming type thing. She actually has some issues that aren't brought out too much, but she was a little bit too much of that perfect character for me. So I didn't care for her a whole lot. Um, Michael, he was so-so. I felt, I had mixed feelings on him. But the characters that I didn't like, the children. Pat was okay, the three daughters. Pat felt pretty good. Winkle was alright because she's, I don't know, children are hard to write. I will give her that. But Marjorie especially, she has this habit of writing some characters that just don't feel real. Marjorie is about eight, I think. And she has this ability, Elizabeth Gouge's books are often also touched by a little bit of the supernatural. She has this ability, she's very sensitive to other people and she has the ability to sense their emotions. So even if her parents are in the next town, if they're happy, it affects her mood. And if they're um, in strife, it affects her mood. But she's like a completely loving, gentle, unselfish little creature. And that just doesn't ring true to me. Um, I mean, yes, I've known very sweet children, but just this idea of an eight-year-old being like this, this otherworldly angelic type creature. I never liked that kind of character. I liked Pat a whole lot more and felt bad for her because she seems to be almost everybody's least favorite. I mean, this is a book where the parents are very straightforward and they're like, yeah, this one's my favorite, that one's my favorite, and neither of their favorites is Pat. Um, poor thing. So, anyway, didn't really like the children. And they also kind of set it up, or she set it up again in that way where they get some perspective at the beginning of the book, and then not much else throughout the rest. Like, Pat gets perspective once, near the beginning of the book. So you think she's going to be like a main character who's helping to tell the story, and then that's it. She doesn't get anything else. She's just mentioned um, on the sidelines throughout the rest of the book. I really don't like that when a book, I don't mind surprises and twists, but when a book sets you up, where the author is like telling you at the beginning of book, telling you at the beginning of the book, that's the setting of the tone. And when they set it up, like this character is going to be important and you're ready for that and you're waiting to see their character develop and then they just get shoved to the side for the whole rest of the book. That's super frustrating. But anyway, didn't care for the daughters. Um, so yeah, kind of the whole school story side of it, the headmistress, Miss Giles, Mary, the three girls, all that was kind of my least favorite part of the plot. There's a lot of other things going on. There's Michael's whole story. And there's John and Daphne's story. So there's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff going on. Surprisingly, the book isn't that long. And surprisingly, like I said, it does work together better than you might think. But to get down to my real issue with the book. It's complicated. Because... Some of the themes and ideas in the book are very deep and profound and beautiful. Um, I don't, it does not bother me that she so strongly puts her religion into her stories. Every author is influenced by their beliefs. No matter what their beliefs are, they're putting it in their books, they're putting it in their characters. The authors who try to be the most objective in the world, their very objectiveness is portraying their worldview. Your worldview is gonna get portrayed in what you write. That's just the way it is. I don't mind that she's straightforward with her beliefs. I don't mind that she presents her views as objective truth. Because when people truly believe something, that is how they portray it. You know, we might disagree with it, but that's how we would portray what we believe as well. So that can kind of bother me where it's like she's portraying this these, tr these things as being 
true and her characters come to believe these specific beliefs as the natural truth that they're led to when it's something that I disagree with, that can bother me a little bit, but at the same time, that's what the author believes. That's what she's going to do. That doesn't bother me so much as the dialogue, the way the characters talk. So her ideas are beautiful. A lot of them are profound, like I said. But pretty much every major conversation that happens in this book between the main characters, they are having a very deep, complex look at the world around them, looking at human character, their observations, their look, their looking at nature and comparing it to spiritual things that so often happens. She's very drawn to nature. She makes comparisons about all kinds of things based on the trees and the birds and all these things. They are beautiful and some of her language is beautiful, but this is not the way that people talk. Once in a while, people can have a deep conversation and I know that these people are going through big shifts in their life where these conversations would be happening. I think the thing that I have a hard time with is the way that they're constantly having these deep, deep thoughts and deep talks, which just doesn't ring true. They're very elegant prose that these people from all different backgrounds are saying. And I think one of the reasons it doesn't ring true, not just that people don't talk like that, even allowing that they do, they all sound the same because they're all coming from Elizabeth Gouge's worldview. No matter the different personalities she gives them, the different backgrounds that they have, in the end, when they talk about their spiritual ideas, their spiritual views, no matter what they're saying about it, whether for or against, no matter what part of the argument, it's her voice that's speaking. They don't have individuality when it comes to the way that they see beauty in the world because that's the way that she sees it. And when this happens, it just makes it feel very unreal to me. Um, like I said, there are beautiful things in the book and I completely understand it if somebody reads it and thinks that it's wonderful. But again, just the amount of serious discussion that these people are having rings a little untrue and the fact that they all speak the same. People don't do that. They don't have, you know, maybe three of the characters say that they all have the depth of understanding and worldview or whatever, but all the characters do this. All of them look at the world and translate the world into these spiritual ideas. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I think if you read the book, you would see what I'm saying in that, again, anytime they have a really deep, deep thought, they all express it in the same way. And so that just makes the book ring not as true for me. It makes it feel like the author is talking her beliefs at me. No matter how nice they might sound, it takes me out of the story. And it makes the characters feel like puppets. So those are my thoughts on that. That's the biggest thing that frustrated me. Again, no matter how great it might be, that that's kind of... That's kind of the, um, just the wrench in, in the mix for me. That these, that these characters all sound the same. They all talk of deep things in the same way. They're all revolving around the same worldview. Even though it's like, oh, this person has a very different worldview than this person. When they actually talk about it, no. This is clearly written by, these two characters are, who are supposed to have opposite worldviews are clearly written by a person with a single worldview. And this can be seen in other ways. Another manifestation of this that bothers me is that they've all read the same literature. Or even if they haven't read it, when they recommend it to each other, it's the type of thing that they would love. I know that maybe in this time period, people were more familiar with the classics. That doesn't seem as far-fetched to me, but that everybody is so intimately familiar with the same books with the same literature, that they all have the same comfortableness in it, that they all quote it and it's part of their lives. Not everybody is that much into literature as much as I would love for them to be. 
that also feels like something of the author coming through. She loves books so much she can't help but put it on all her characters in the same way. So yeah, the constant references to her favorite authors and her favorite characters by all these different people gets annoying. It's like, okay, we know who you like. Um, this book had a lot of references, and I didn't mind this so much because it was even part of the story. A lot of references to Don Quixote. Um, Steve Bell's had that as well. Don Quixote, I think, is like Elizabeth Gouge's favorite character ever. Um, that's fine. She referenced it a lot in this book, though. And also Puck, for whatever reason, from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Anytime anybody has like a flash of humor or mischief, she talks about Puck. In both this book and A City of Bells, it's like, is that the only humorous character in all of literature that anytime anybody is humorous, then they're like Puck? That gets pretty annoying. So yeah, I have a lot of issues with it. All of that being said, though, my annoyance with people having unrealistically complex conversations constantly, the references to literature, where it really just feels like the author's coming through, her efforts that become kind of painfully obvious at times to mitigate this by people being like, oh, I have all these ideas and I know, I know they're crude or I'm writing this and I know it's sentimental. Her kind of trying to casualize it just makes it worse. All of that being said, there is some true greatness here. The way that the characters actually at times honestly self-examine um, themselves, self-examination, and honestly acknowledge what's really going on, particularly with Daphne in her marriage. Um, I think that such things are very rare. In books nowadays, we read about people coming to terms, they struggle with who they are, they come to terms with it, and they realize that they're enough, and they're good. And in this, it's these people who are going along unhappily, or whatever, and it's not that they need to come to a realization that they're good, they actually come to realize come to a realization of how they are wrong and how they are not living correctly and they actually change it and that is what makes them happier and that's what brings about the positive in their lives. So I think that those themes are really good. Some of them are honestly, like I said, very deep and really great. Um, reading it, I definitely felt convicted of things. So I do think it is a worthwhile read. And I think my issues with it are really largely personal. Um, I don't think everybody would have the problems with it that I do. Um, yeah, the references to literature and such. I have a big pet peeve of authors inserting themselves. And if you don't mind that or such things you don't really notice, you'll definitely like it more. And yeah, I know that people in books don't talk like real people, but they at least need to sound like they do. And this did not emulate real life conversation to me, but it is some pretty amazing conversation. So I, I have problems with it, but definitely a worthwhile read. Um, sorry if I repeated myself a lot in this video. I was really, really have a hard time talking about books that I'm so conflicted on where I'm like it has greatness but it has all these things that bother me so much so it's hard to hard to put into words I if I was rating it out of five stars I would give it four which it depends on you know it depends on how you rate things that might seem very high to some people um but yeah I think I would give it a four and for anybody who might want to read it, the beginning is the hardest part. At the very beginning, I was like, okay, this is going to be too much because it pretty much immediately dives into these um, imaginative visions. Her speaking very, very abstractly in a very visionary sense, especially of the imaginations of childhood, um, just 
kind of these spiritual wanderings in the imaginations of the characters can be overwhelming, and it definitely was. And for, in the opening chapters, I was kind of like, this is, this is going to be way too vague and mysterious for me. But it does, it does get more grounded in reality for the most part. But yeah, those are my thoughts on The Rosemary Tree by Elizabeth Gouge. Sorry if this video was all over the place, but thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.